how they were able to really coolly determine the charge of an electron okay, by looking through a microscope. Okay, kind of cool stuff. Okay. Um, what you're responsible for recognizing is that Millikan and Fletcher are tied to the discovery of the charge of an electron. You don't need to know what the charge is. You just need to know that that's what they're responsible for. Is that a question? No? Uh, what would we say about Thompson? So Thompson gave us a model of the atom. He said we had that plum pudding model. Protons were, or sorry, electrons were these objects floating around in a sea of positive charge. That's what Thompson gives us. What else did he give us? He actually gives us two big things. To come up with this model of the atom, he actually had to discover that we had something smaller than an atom. He really directly discovered protons and electrons. His primary discovery is for electrons. Okay, he then once had the concept of, oh, we've got smaller particles. He then used that to come up with a model for the atom. So you're responsible for knowing that tie. It's more funny if you watch me trip over it. For Millikan and ultimately Fletcher, it's that they were able to determine the charge on an electron. You don't even need to know the charge. You just need to know that they discovered the charge. You might remember the oil drop experiment is typically how it's referenced. So then we push a little bit further along and we encounter Rutherford. Okay. And Rutherford actually didn't do the experiment. Well, actually, he might have. But he and his research group uh, went through and designed an experiment to test Thompson's model of the atom. Because in Thompson's model, we don't really have anything of any significant mass. Okay? Protons are just this kind of sea of charge. Electrons are these physical objects, and we've determined that electrons have a very tiny mass. Okay? So really, at this point, Thompson's model is pretty much saying that we don't really have mass, okay? or much significant mass anywhere. It's just dispersed over a larger area. Rutherford comes along and kind of tests that model. And how he goes through and tests it is he takes these things known as alpha particles, okay, which are a form of radioactivity. And he was able to fire these alpha particles very particularly at a bit of gold foil, okay, thin, thin gold foil. Anybody seen like pictures of astronauts and that, that face mask that's all gold? Okay, but if it's gold, how could they possibly see through it? It's, thin. it's really thin. Same things here. So they're taking a very thin sheet of gold, and they're firing a particle at it. Okay. So if we threw a brick at an astronaut's face mask, it's going to bounce. It's not going to pass through. Okay. But what we're taking is these small particles, and we're saying, OK, what happens if we fire these small particles? What will happen to them? Okay. If it's solid, we might expect they bounce back, or they might just pass straight through. If it's Thompson's model, what would happen? It should go straight through. Okay. Um, and so what they wanted to do was then detect these alpha particles, which is the next big part of this design. So we can't just throw alpha particles at something and just say, oh, it's going to pass through. I need somebody on the other end to catch those particles or detect them. One of the problems with alpha particles, they're very, very tiny and not easy to detect. So we have to build a detector to, to recognize them. And it's really just a sheet of material that responds to radioactive materials. Right, so we see it kind of a light beam, acknowledging that something hit it. Okay, and one of the things that I at least used to like to say was that Rutherford didn't like Thompson, which is a load of nonsense because they were friends, they liked each other, it's really cool. Okay, but I like to say that he didn't like Thompson and he thought Thompson's model was a load of crap okay, because of how he designed his experiment. So if we take a look at his experiment, we have our source of alpha particles in a fancy little black box, kind of the glowing yellow, and our alpha particle beam flying at our gold foil. If he trusted Thompson's model to work, where would you put a catcher of those alpha particles? The exact opposite side. That's it. If Thompson's model is right, what happens? The beams go through, someone can catch them over there. If Rutherford trusted Thompson's model, really all he has to do is put a catcher right there. And what would he expect to see? 
The particles should accumulate there. But he questioned it. Okay? My theory was that he didn't like him, which was completely wrong. So instead, the theory is that he's a good scientist and he wanted to test all <laughs> possibilities. So instead of just putting the catcher at the back end of the beam, he put it all the way around the sample. Okay? And so it's not super visible. I mean, that screen is a little bit nicer. But what we've got is our detector all the way around. And if Thompson's model's correct, boom, we see stuff hit right there, nothing else. Okay. So what's the point of everything else? Well, everything else is just good science, making sure that nothing else could possibly happen. Okay. So like, oh, we'll just expect to see stuff hit there, we'll publish it, and we'll say, oh, Thompson, you're a great guy, look at how fantastic you are. And instead, they ran the experiment, and yes, most of the time, they saw stuff hit there. But some of the time, they saw stuff hit elsewhere. Well, if I throw a ball at the wall, what do I expect the ball to do? Bounce. Bounce off the wall. How many times would I expect to throw the ball at the wall and hit that wall? If I'm aiming at the blue wall. Depends how bad your aim is. <laughs> okay. Theoretically, if I'm firing a straight beam of balls at that wall, there's no way it should be coming out over here. That doesn't make sense. Okay. Maybe my aim is bad. Random particle, whoosh! I've got a nasty curve on my throw, okay? And it hits that wall. Fine, okay, maybe there's a rear, weird one in 20 chance. But what are the odds I'm throwing the ball at that wall and it hits behind me? So it never hit that wall at all. Okay, so it never hit that wall at all. Wait a second. How did that happen? Something in the between that wall and me throwing had to have deflected the ball to a different location. That something in between was the gold foil, but the gold foil was see-through, allowed things to pass through. So, so there has to be something in that gold foil causing the deflection. If Thompson's model is correct, there is nothing there. Everything passes straight through. According to Rutherford's experiment, something is there. What does that mean about Thompson's model? It's wrong. It's wrong. Yes. It's not that there's something smaller, it's that there's something else in there with mass. Something larger than just particles free floating around in space. Because our alpha particles are massive. If they were big, or uh, if they were roughly the same size as that, we might expect a bounce back. But we're saying that the alpha particle is much, much larger than those. So we would never expect a bounce back. The only reason we can get that bounce back is that there has to be something there that has enough mass to cause the bounce back. What did he discover? And then the nucleus. Okay. That's the discovery. So Rutherford, with his gold foil theory, came up with and said, Thompson's model, yeah, that's nice, that's pretty, but it's wrong. Okay. Uh, no more sweets. We're now sticking with positive charge being located in a highly dense nucleus and electrons being on the outside. Why did he say positive charge? Well, that comes back to the identity of alpha particles, which we'll address in just a second, but you had a question. Very good. Okay. Alpha particles. What are alpha particles? Okay. These are a form of radiation, and they happen to be charged. What charge do they happen to be charged? Positive. What happens when I bring the north end of a magnet near the north end of a magnet? They repel. The same thing's happening here. The alpha particles get fired in, and they will get deflected because they are encountering a solid nucleus of positive charge. That's why it's deflecting so massively. Okay. Now we have a nucleus, and now we can kind of work from our basic ground fundamentals of atomic structure. But before we go into that, we've got a question, and then I've got enough more stuff. That symbol is right that symbol is supposed to be an alpha, which probably looked prettier in my initial document, but yeah, that's just an alpha symbol for alpha particles. So alpha looks like the Christian fish? Is that what that is? Oh, really uh, it's the Greek letter <laughs> for alpha. Okay. Yeah. I don't know anything about Greek letters. So. It's okay. <laughs> You'll learn. We encounter a few of them. Okay. What is an alpha particle? Okay. Well, an alpha particle we established was a form of radiation, okay. positively charged radiation. Where do we get it? I just go out to the store and buy alpha particles. 
No. Okay. Can I just go out to the store and buy radioactive materials? Not very easily with that either. So somebody had to go through and enable us to have this radiation. Okay. Radiation is potentially dangerous, okay, and it's also fairly rare. Okay, so we run into a big issue here. It's dangerous and rare. So somebody had to go out and find it, collect it, purify it, so that we can use this. Why does it have to be pure? I have to make sure that the only things impacting that gold foil are alpha particles. If there's other stuff, maybe I'm observing something else weird. Okay? Maybe there's a snowflake coming out of there, and that snowflake just does its own weird thing. Okay? And it's what's hitting the detector. I have to make sure there's no snowflakes. It's just alpha particles. Okay? So there's a lot of science that goes behind that. And this is the part that I find the most fascinating. Who is primarily responsible for radiation? Or do you have a name associated with it? Geiger. Geiger's an important name, also involved in this research. There's another big name. Only nobody? Was it students? No, not Rutherford students. See the one who, there's two guys who thought that, like, uh, kept making it smaller and smaller each. No, nope. and there's actually a bigger flaw in your statement. You said he. Geiger's also a he. Madame Curie. Okay, this is a pretty fascinating point. We're turn of the 19, 1900s, right at 1900 area. Okay, do women have the right to vote? No. No, no power whatsoever. Okay, pretty much looked down on across all societies, and yet here we have in roughly 1900. Curie going through, identifying, finding, purifying a radioactive species. Okay? And taking that radioactive species and making it available for everybody. And what do we mean by making it available? If we've gone through and done research that's really cool, what do we typically want to do with it? Share it. Share it. So you come up with an awesome invention, the iPhone. What do you do with that information? You sell it. Sell it. Or you patent it so that everybody must buy it from you so that you become a millionaire. What did Curie do with her information? Freely accessible. No patents. This meant that the ability to find radioactive materials or purify them and get them into a state that was easily usable was widely available. This meant that other scientists could then take that information and build on it and work with it. Okay. Does that happen in today's society? Not very often. There are a few scientists that believe that, okay, but most do not. Because they're spending lots of time and effort to build these things and come up with these great grand ideas, they kind of want both the acknowledgement for it and they also want the monetary reward for all the hours of time they spent on it. Right? So there is a balance between the validity of patents being useful and allowing science to continue and then also the counter argument that patents shut down science because now you prevent that information from being used in other features. So it's kind of a neat little debate. Curie is an interesting one in this respect because she didn't patent her idea. All right, let's push this a little bit further with Curie because I find her a fascinating subject, which, by the way, if you're interested, she is one of the scientists on the topic list. Um, so female, can't vote, worked to discover and maintain alpha particles, all that kind of fun stuff. Pretty big discovery. Probably one of the reasons why Rutherford was able to actually do this experiment because without alpha particles... What do you fire at gold foil? More gold. <laughs> you could try throwing more gold at it. <laughs> the issue with gold is it's just going to bounce so it doesn't work out. Okay, we really need this radio radioactive source. Okay? Um, radiation is now such an important topic and such an important part of the history of uh, our atomic understanding that larger science societies said, hey, that's really cool. We need to acknowledge your importance. That larger science society happens to be known as the Nobel Foundation. Okay. So can't vote, and she gets a Nobel Prize. Sweet. Pretty cool. She continues to do work with radiation, uh, and something like 10 years later, what does she do? She gets a second Nobel Prize. Okay. There are, I believe, two people in existence that have earned or won 
more than one Nobel Prize. Both of them happen to be chemists, so good field to go into. One of them is Curie, and one of them, I think, is Pauling. I think it's Pauling. I might be wrong on that. Okay. Interesting thing about that, between those two, Pauling was a man, had all these awesome tools, and he could only get two. Curie, woman, didn't have all these tools, and still got two. Push a little bit further. If we look at Curie's Nobel Prizes, they are both in science. Pauling is in science and peace. I mean, anybody can do peace. <coughs> science is the hard stuff. Okay. So we have someone that doesn't have the right to vote, not respected in the overall community, and yet still achieving two Nobel Prizes. Right. This is amazing, and one of the reasons why it makes sense to not exclude people of different creeds, colors, sexes, because we can all contribute to science, and it is all important information. We all have that ability. We just have to get into it and tap it. Okay? And for those of you saying, well, it sure sounds like society as a whole really appreciated Curie. Okay. Curie was based in France. Every nation has their own science society. There's the French Academy of Sciences, something like that, in France. She was denied acceptance to that society. Two Nobel Prizes. Wasn't allowed to be a member because she was a woman. Yeah. So just be kind of aware of it. Um, pretty brilliant scientist and at the same time incredibly stupid. Right? Because anybody know how she died? Radiation. Cancer caused by radiation poisoning. Uh, because they were fully aware of the hazards of this, but they would still carry around little vials of these radioactive materials like in their pocket. You know, like, not exactly the most brilliant. Right? <laughs> but uh, when you can put everything else together, yeah, fine, I'll accept that. Right? <laughs> we all have flaws, right? So Even she, Superman has his kryptonite. So she also discovered radiation poisoning. Uh, part of it, yeah. Um, so with all that, we get Rutherford's model. Okay. And we get the birth, birth of the nucleus, okay. and the nucleus being that positive charge. So this pretty much flips Thompson's model on its head, because Thompson just said pos a sea of positive charge. Well, there's no longer a sea of positive charge. All the positive charge is condensed into one spot. Okay. And then we know it's a super tiny spot, because when we fired the beam, only very few particles bounced back. Most of them flew straight through. That meant where we collected all of this mass, it was a very tiny, tiny space. Okay? Um, as an idea of the scale of that space, okay, if we take the atom diameter, 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. Okay, well, that makes sense. That's like, you know, 8 centimeters. That's a couple inches. It's a joke, by the way. Uh, the nucleus has a diameter of about 10 to the minus 13. Well, that's only off by what? Minus five? That's not that big of a deal. Okay, how big of a difference could that be? That's like me versus the shortest person in the classroom. Okay. Let's scale this up to something that's a little bit easier to understand. If we take the size of the atom as the superdome, the nucleus is a marble inside the superdome. This is a massive scale issue. Okay. Powers of 10 are pretty phenomenally, hugely different from each other. So if we're thinking about the size of an atom, we're really referencing its outermost part, which is not the nucleus. The outermost part is then going to be what? Valence Our valence shell. Let's get less specific. The electrons. The electrons are going to contribute to our size. If we're going to be concerned about the mass, we'll then need to look at the protons, okay, which brings up another issue. Our protons are now all crammed into a tiny, tiny space. Well, what's the charge on proton A? What's the charge on proton B? Positive. Okay, just like magnets. We take the north end and the north end of a magnet, and we put them near each other, and they're totally happy to be near each other. <laughs> now they go flying away from each other. Okay. So with Rutherford's discovery here of the proton, or sorry, the nucleus, he then says, well, if we bring protons near each other, there has to be something holding them together. Right. I don't know what that is, but it has to be something holding them there. It can't be a, another proton, well, because that's positive. It can't be an electron, because the electrons are on the outside. We need a new particle. That new particle can't be negative or positive. What is not negative or positive? Yeah. Neutral. So the name he chose? 
neutron. Right? So we now have the theory of a neutron existing from Rutherford's model. So we get the nucleus and the theory that we have a neutron. Pretty powerful stuff. Okay. <clears throat> He really only theorized this because of that whole positive-positive repulsion. That's that guess. That's the theory behind it. Okay? It was later actually discovered by James Chadwick, 1919, so something like 15 years later. Do we need okay. to know that? Uh, in a previous class, yes, but not in this class. Okay. Okay. Um, Chadwick is interesting because he did actually discover a neutron. He actually was able to find it. Um, but the part that I find kind of fascinating is remember how I said Thompson and Rutherford didn't get along? Right? Well, they actually got along really well. Rutherford was Thompson's student. Uh, and Chadwick also got along with them because Chadwick was Rutherford's student. Right? So kind of this incestuous line of, of researchers and, and students all kind of lining up on, along that same kind of topic and all pushing for the same understanding of an atom. Right? Pretty neat. So the big summary we get out of all of this kind of history is what we understand at the easiest level, I guess, would be the way to say it, is our subatomic particles. We have three of them. We have an electron, we have a proton, and we have a neutron. Okay. Have I talked about the ten-finger rule yet? Okay. Scientists have short, or at least chemists, or maybe this chemist, has a, a short ability to comprehend words and languages and stuff like that. So if it's longer than 10 words or 10 letters, it becomes an issue. Okay. Don't ask me to count. But electron's too long of a word, so instead I don't want to write electron, I'm going to come up with a symbol. What symbol do I want to use? E, e because electron. English begins with E, electron. Proton, e. P, neutron, e. N. You'll notice that we aren't using just E, P, and N. We're also adding an extra bit of information there in the upper right-hand corner. What are we specifying in that upper right-hand corner? The charge on said particle. Okay? So we are responsible for knowing the name of our subatomic particles, the symbol for our subatomic particles, and the charge on those subatomic particles. This is where we have to be careful. Didn't we say the charge was like one point, I don't even remember the number, 9 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, something like that? Okay. Does that say 1.9 times 10 to the minus C? <coughs> so we aren't memorizing the charge. What are we memorizing? It begins with an R. The relative, the relative charge. The charge of an electron is equal to a proton, but opposite in magnitude. Okay? We also need to know their locations. The protons and the neutrons are defined as being in the nucleus. Well, if they're in the nucleus, the electron must be not in the nucleus, better said, outside the nucleus. Okay. And then the last part, the mass, okay, we need to know how do these particles contribute to mass. Is that a question? No? Okay, you're fine. The proton and the neutrons are the ones that contribute to mass. That's kind of part of Rutherford's theory. They have the same relative mass, which we will define as one. The electron relative mass is 1 over 1,836. Okay. So what do you think? Really big, really small? Really, really small relative to the other ones. Okay. Let's equate that to, say, me. Okay. We take my mass and the mass of one of my hairs. If I remove that hair, has my mass changed? Yes. Yes. Significantly? No. No. So what can we say the mass of an electron actually is? We can change that to zero. I don't care about the mass of an electron. It doesn't contribute to the overall mass enough to make it worthwhile. Even if we put 100 of them together, I'm still a hundredth of the mass of a proton. Okay? So its relative contribution to the mass is tiny. We'll ignore it. Okay? Make sense? Okay. What happens when we now bring these particles all together? Well, if I bring a proton and electron near each other, okay, they will start to interact. Okay? And they will interact to make what? Ends with an H. And rhymes with oxygen. 
So I think some people are laughing and then just not saying the answer. Come on. Begins with H, rhymes with oxygen. Hydrogen. We have a hydrogen element. Doesn't have to be awesome rhyming, but it rhymes. You can't <laughs> challenge really. that. Gin, gin and gin. It's there. Gin. Okay. So hydrogen is our element okay, by combining an electron and a proton. If we look at our periodic table, that is our very first element, upper left-hand corner. We've got lots of ones associated with it. The upper right-hand corner is a one that represents what? It's hydrogen. Helium is all over the right. Atomic number. I like that answer. How do you know it's the atomic number? It's right there on the wall. <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean? Yes. Elaborate. There's a key. This is That's what I wanted to hear. There's a key. There's a key on our periodic table that tells us in the upper right-hand corner that that is the atomic number. Okay. Anybody know what the atomic number is? Don't tell me one. It's the number of protons. Just the number of protons. Okay. We also see a 1 underneath it, 1.01. .01. So it's not a whole number. What is that 1.01 .01 representing? The mass. Okay. Well, what particles contributed to the mass? Protons and neutrons. So that's interesting. We have a fractional value there. We'll come back to that. Okay. So our periodic table is organized that way. We've got the atomic number, upper right-hand corner, atomic weight in the lower left-hand. Okay. The corners... Are relevant. Above is typically your atomic number. Below is typically your atomic mass on the periodic table. And all periodic tables seem to be organized that way. Okay. But what if we're not on a periodic table? For instance, if we take a look at the slide, do we see a periodic table? No. Okay. We're now looking at the atomic notation, or what I like to refer to as the nuclear notation, because all we're going to be referencing are the pieces that are in a nucleus, which happen to be protons, and neutrons. Okay. So when we look at this notation, the first thing that stands out, hopefully, is that we see this SY, which is representing the symbol of our element. So if we were going to represent hydrogen, our symbol for hydrogen is? H. Why did we pick H for hydrogen? Starts with H. Okay, but we have to be careful with that. Not all elements, symbols, aren't necessarily what they sound like. Okay. For instance, tungsten. Symbol is W. Why? German. Okay. The symbols and the names associated with them, for number one, the, the names are based on the language that we're in. We're in English, so we tend to use English names for the elements. The symbols are universal. Okay. Tungsten was originally discovered by a German, so they named it in German. And the symbol or the name for tungsten in German happens to begin with a W. Uh, Wolfram. Wolframite. Boing. I got it. Okay. That begins with W. Okay. So that's why we use the symbol W. Okay. Why, when we transfer over to English, do we change the name but keep the symbol? Something has to stay constant. <coughs> Just be thankful it's the symbol. Okay. So hydrogen, H. We then have two other things that we need to include, our mass number and our atomic number. Well, we just talked about the atomic number, right? Okay. The atomic number was what? Yes, one, which meant the number of protons. Okay. Where is the number of protons specified in our atomic notation? On the periodic table, it was on top, and in our atomic notation, it's... On the bottom. Why? Science. Okay. So we would specify our number of protons in the lower left-hand corner. Okay. Well, that corner is now occupied. So if I want to now bring in the mass, which is now referencing the number of protons and neutrons, I need to find a new corner. Which corner do I use? I use the upper left, and that's going to correspond to the mass number. The mass number, by definition, is the number of protons and neutrons. When we look at hydrogen as an element, 
Hydrogen very typically has no neutrons, which means its net mass number should be 1. And so typically, that's what we're looking at for hydrogen. If we take a look at the periodic table, do we see mass number written up there? We see atomic weight. Well, what's the difference? Is there a difference between mass and weight? Yeah. That can kind of get into all sorts of gravity, annoying, irritating things. But yes, there is a distinct difference there, though they are inextricably linked. Our mass number is defined as exactly the number of protons and neutrons. When we look at an individual element up there, you'll notice that all of the atomic weights, okay, I don't think any of them are whole numbers. There might be one or two. Uh, the man-made ones are. But none of the other ones are. Why? Does the neutron change the element? No, the element is defined by the number of protons. Okay, so if I have one proton, it is hydrogen. What if I have one proton and one neutron? It's still hydrogen. How is it different from that hydrogen that I have the symbol up there on? Its mass would be different. And so what I would be looking at is hydrogen with still one proton, but now the mass number would be two. And it, neutrons. Careful, it has how many neutrons? Just one, because remember your mass number is the sum of protons and neutrons. If we're hydrogen, we already have one proton, which means we have only one neutron to get us to the two. Okay. So normal hydrogen is just one proton and no neutrons? Normal hydrogen is one proton, no neutrons. But we can get hydrogen with one neutron. Okay. That Hydrogen is now heavier because it has a neutron. So we can refer to that hydrogen as? Way to get fancy on it, yes. Heavy hydrogen. It's really creative, that's it. Yeah, we can refer to it as heavy hydrogen. How do we get heavy hydrogen? It needs to have an extra neutron. How do we get that extra neutron there is beyond the scope of this class, which is my fancy way of saying I don't know how to get that at time. I know naturally it does show up which gets us to the atomic weights on the periodic table. When we look at hydrogen as an element in the environment, when we grab hydrogen at a random hydrogen element, more than likely, it's hydrogen 1. Okay, so when I say hydrogen 1, what is that 1 referring to? So I've heard a bunch of things. We could say one proton. I would argue saying that that's one proton is a bit silly. By saying hydrogen, how many protons are there? So why would I say one one? Yeah, that's a bit redundant. What is that one referencing? It's mass. Not its atomic mass, it's mass number. Okay? Which in this case happens to be one proton. What if I said hydrogen two? It's its mass number is two, which means one proton, because it's hydrogen, and one neutron. One neutron. Okay. If I reach out and grab hydrogen, 99% of the time, the hydrogen that I grab is hydrogen one. 1% 1 of the time, I reach out and I grab hydrogen two. So if I take a sample, all possible hydrogens, and I want to know the mass, of all my possible hydrogens, the average mass. Is the average mass going to be exactly one? No. Will it be exactly two? No. What will the mass be closer to? One. one. Okay. How close to the one depends on the exact abundance of each of those isotopes. If we take a look at the mass number for, or the atomic weight for hydrogen on the periodic table, which one do you think is more abundant? Hydrogen one or hydrogen two? One. Hydrogen one. If we take a look at, let's pick a more interesting one. Oh, but I have to remember all of them. Uh, chlorine. We can do chlorine. Chlorine has two common forms, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. Which one is more abundant? Why 35? The atomic weight on the periodic table is closer to the 35. Because when we're taking the average, 
If there's more of it, it's going to be weighted closer to that. Why? Why is it weighted closer to it? So again, right. no, okay. So if we take a look at chlorine as an element, the atomic weight on the periodic table is 35.45. What the atomic weight represents is all masses. Okay. So we are all humans. Okay. If we took the average of our mass all in here, it's not going to be my mass. Okay. I'm probably the most massive. It's going to be somewhere in between. Okay, will it be weighted closer to my end or closer to uh, who thinks they're small? That might be a loaded question. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe pointing people out is probably a bad idea too. Uh, if we take a survey, do you think you guys, as our class as an average, is closer to my mass or further from my mass? Let's try that. Probably further. So the number is going to be closer to the smaller end than on the higher end, because I am at the biggest end of that, because we're taking an average of everybody. The same thing is happening with our atomic weights on the periodic table. With chlorine, I'm telling you there's two common isotopes. One is 35, one is 37. 35 is very light, or lighter, and the 37 is two neutrons heavier. Because the 35 is more abundant when I average all of the masses, the 35 contributes a larger percentage to the overall percentage, and so the average result is closer to the 35. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you were just explaining atomic weight? This is atomic weight. Yep. And why are we looking at atomic weight when what's up on the board is mass number and atomic number? Okay. Well, where do you find the mass number? If I do that and that. Can you point to the periodic table? Does the periodic table tell you the number of neutrons? It gives you a ballpark. It gives you the average. It gets you a ballpark. It does not get you the exact value. The mass number must be explicitly presented in the name of the element. Okay? What the periodic table gets you is the average number of neutrons for that element. Okay? And as an average, that's where we're getting the decimal from. Kind of, sort of? So what it's coming down to is there's three different things. Atomic number. Does the atomic number ever change? No. no. The atomic number will always represent what? The number of protons of the element. Every single time. Never changes. The mass number tells you what? The protons and neutrons. Every single time. The atomic weight tells you the average of your mass numbers for an element. Okay. And we might say, well, that's such a subtle difference. Why do we care about it? I agree that is a very subtle difference, but it is a subtle difference that is important enough that somebody who... Let's cover that up temporarily. Yeah. The mass number is not there. The mass number is not on the periodic table. But the atomic number is, which is the one... The atomic number will always be given to you on the periodic table. And the, the atomic number is the number of protons. Yep. The mass number, which is not there, is the protons and neutrons. Yes. And we're discussing why the mass number is relevant? We need to know why the mass number is relevant, because if we use atomic notation, you can be asked for the number of neutrons, which we'll see right here. Okay. There is a question, but we'll look at that next part. Um, how do you find the mass number? The mass number has to be given to you, okay. okay, in some form or another. If we take a look at this example, oh, stupid formatting. So this is why it's nice to have, like, an editable system. There we go. Okay. Is the mass number given to you in this format? Yes. Oh, wow, this formatting went all sorts of wonky on me. Okay. The element is what? How do you know it's silicon? It says SI. It does not say silicon. How do we know it's silicon? You had to memorize that SI meant silicon, which you've all been working on, right? Since you all are saying because it says SI, I'm going to guess you've been working on that pretty well. Is that a question? No. So we know the element is silicon. The atomic number is 14. 
The atomic number is always written in the lower left-hand corner in atomic notation. What does the atomic number tell us? The number of protons. So for silicon, I know there are 14 protons, which is a bit of a weird statement to make because it's silicon, which means there's 14. I didn't need to know the atomic number being 14. Just by having the symbol, I know the atomic number. I know the number of protons. The atomic number is almost always uh, a redundant piece of information. So we have the atomic number is 35, and you give us atomic mass, you just minus that from whatever you get. Which gets us to the next part. Okay. If I have a mass number of 29, what does that tell me? The mass number is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Do I know the number of protons? Do I know the number of neutrons? I can determine it because I know the protons plus the neutrons is the mass number, which then gets me neutrons being... So you guys did that math right. Math right. Make sense? That's it. Yes, I can keep that up for a second. Okay. So really all we're looking at is defining terms and where things are shown. What is that notation? Where do we find it? Is it always in that formation? Okay. When we're referring to atomic notation, it is always in this formation. Unfortunately, when we move to the periodic table, are we in atomic notation? No. no. We've moved out of atomic notation into a different format. Why? I don't know. I, honestly, I don't have a good reason for you. Okay. Probably because we decided the atomic number is important to have on top because if we move through the periodic table left to right, hydrogen is number one. Where's number two? Uh, immediately to the right. We've now finished one row, so we've moved to the next row, and that row starts with lithium with three. Next one, four. Next one, five. Where are the numbers written? At the top. Why? When we read, where do we read? Top to, top to bottom. It's easier to see the atomic number written on top. Why is the atomic notation written the other way? Probably because we decided the atomic number is redundant information and ends up dropping off, and we decided that we wanted the atomic mass as a more relevant number to look at up top. Completely arbitrary. Completely. So they get the So 14 plus the number of neutrons is our mass number, which is 29. We were told here the mass number was 29. So I do 14 minus on both sides, and I'd end up with the number of neutrons. So N, which is our number of neutrons, would be 29 minus 14, which is 15. See it? The neutrons is never directly given to you. It must be solved for. Okay, um, but the mass number always is. Mass number will always be given to you, particularly if we want to solve for the neutrons. All right, and with that, I'm sorry. We're moving on. If you've got questions, you can come back and ask. There's all the unhidden stuff. So that gets us to this next fun part. Atomic structure in our periodic table. We've got a nice little table there. Let's spend, oh, I don't know. Let's see how fast you can fill it in versus how fast I can fill it in. Let's try that. So we got our particle. We got the location. We got the mass. We got the charge. We have the symbol. And we have the meaning. The meaning is probably going to be the one that's challenging, which means I'm going to leave it for the end. Okay. I want you to fill in as much information as you can about each of those three particles. Okay. So we've got all of our kind of rough definitions filled in. Now we run into that interesting one with the meaning. What is the meaning? Okay, 42. No, electrons. That's already specified in our charge. Okay, so let's try a different one because electrons are a little bit challenging. Maybe the protons will help you out. What is the meaning of our protons? I take a step further than atomic number. It defines the element. 
If I know the number of protons, I know what element I'm looking at. Okay. Neutrons, I would argue, is the next easiest one. The electrons gets a bit challenging because we haven't used the word yet. What are the neutrons? To find our isotope, isotope, again, to me, is too fancy of a word. Yes, you are correct in calling it an isotope. Defines our mass. Okay, but don't protons contribute to mass? Yeah, but we already knew that. We already said the protons defined the element. So in addition to our definition of the element, what defines the mass beyond that? Well, that's going to come down to the number of neutrons we have. And now the hardest one, because again, using a word that we haven't talked about yet, electrons. What do the electrons define for us? There's the word. Define charge. Protons contribute a positive charge to our overall molecule. But since once I've established, or not our molecule, our atom, but once I've established what the atom is, the protons are fixed. So if I say it's carbon, I have six protons, period. What's going to determine the charge on that carbon atom? How many electrons I've added to it, just like the mass with our neutrons. Okay. So if I have a zero-charged carbon, how many electrons are present? Six, because I need exactly enough to cancel out the charge on the proton. So those are the meanings that I associate with them because I think they help me understand where those pieces are. So if I'm asked a question about charge, I know that I'm really thinking about the number of electrons present in that molecule. Okay. If I'm asked what the element is, I'm looking at the protons. I don't care about the electrons. I don't care about the neutrons. Okay, Kind of makes sense? Yes. Um, in my notes, a couple of things over here. Fine. Um, the symbols were just like E with the little minus symbol, but didn't have a one. Good point. Um, so if we look at the symbols, or sorry, as I interrupt you, was that your question? Yeah, why no, I was no, okay, good. Why, they're different just making sure. why did I write the one as opposed to just leaving it blank? Because it's the charge. But, but before it was just written as E minus, why did I write the one there? Did I need to write the one? No. Why did I write the one? Because I thought there was a one written there before, honestly. I typically don't write the one. Same, same. Same for the proton. Yeah. Okay. One is oftentimes implied, and we don't have to specify that number. Okay. We absolutely would never write E minus 2 because... There wouldn't be a charge of negative 2. An electron is not negatively 2 charged. It's only negative 1. And because it is only a negative 1, we can imply the number, which is why it wasn't written before. Okay. If we wanted to add that extra layer of, no, it's seriously, it's 1, then I can write a 1. No, seriously, a proton is plus 1. I can write the 1. Do I need to? No. Okay. okay. I saw 1 first, but then... That's an interesting question with the neutron. I would always write the zero. So does atomic mass of 12 and atomic number of 6 is 16 times or 16 or Say that again. For C, well, what the element is, the atomic number is 6 and the atomic mass is 12, so there's 12 neutrons. Careful. Do we know the number of neutrons? No. How do we calculate the number of neutrons? Our atomic mass, or not our atomic mass, and this is what drives me up the wall, the mass number. Atomic mass is not the mass number. Yeah. Atomic mass is the equivalent of atomic weight. It is the average of all forms of carbon. The most common form of carbon, as we might guess, has how many neutrons? Six. Six. Because when we do that quick calculation, it is closest to 12. Wait, say that one more time. Sorry. 
the most common form of carbon has how many neutrons? Six, because it has six protons. To get up to a mass of 12, what do we need? Six neutrons. Okay. And because that number, 12.01, is close to 12, and a mass of six protons and six neutrons is 12, and those are really close, that's going to be the most common form of it. Okay. Are there other forms? Yes. But the atomic mass does not tell us specifically how many protons and neutrons. At best, we can guess. Carbon happens to have, carbon-12 happens to have six neutrons. That is not carbon-12. That is carbon of all isotopes. That is a periodic table notation. That is all carbon. The most common form of carbon has six neutrons. To get the exact number of neutrons, what do we need? The mass number. Not the atomic mass, not the atomic weight, the mass number. And unfortunately, it's related to atomic mass and atomic weight, but they're not the same. Mass number is the number given to you. Yes, the mass number will be given explicitly to all. But it's not on the So we've talked about elements that, have, that are heavy. Can they have, like, less nucleus than? Less neutrons? Neutrons, yes. Yes, they can. You can have light atoms, too. How do we decide anything about our neutrons? What's going to determine the amount of neutrons we have? For instance, hydrogen. Did hydrogen have a neutron and its most common isotope? It was hydrogen-1, no neutrons. When did we first see a neutron? Hydrogen-2. Or, fair enough, hydrogen-2 could have worked. The other one, I was referring to our elements. Helium is our first place that we see neutrons appear. Helium comes in with two protons. Its most common isotope would have how many neutrons? Two, because that gets us as close as possible to the four mass. Okay, it's a ballpark. Why do we have neutrons starting with helium and not with hydrogen? Why do we have neutrons? The whole point of the neutron was to hold the positive charges near each other. Do we need a neutron to hold the positive charge in hydrogen? Why not? There's only one. Do we need one for helium? Yeah. Why? There's two protons. The instant I have more than one proton, what am I also going to have to introduce? The glue to hold them together. That glue is our neutron. And if you transition through, you'll notice as a general trend, every proton introduces one neutron. The further along you get, you end up introducing more neutrons. If I want to glue marbles together. I just need enough glue to hold where they touch, right? I'm going to put glue around the whole marble, just that one point. What happens is I add another marble. I need more glue. I need the glue to attach at two points. What happens if I add another marble? More glue, and more glue, and more glue. Eventually, what happens? I have so much glue that what starts to happen? It starts becoming unstable, and it falls apart. We get nuclear radiation. When does radiation appear on our periodic table? With the really large elements. Okay? It typically does not show up earlier because there isn't enough, there's no reason to fall apart. That reason has to do with the glue in our nuclei. So you have three protons and you have two neutrons to hold them in. Like, if, you have a link, you have two if you're looking linearly, yes. Are we looking linearly? Mm -hmm. There's a three dimensionality characteristic to it, so it doesn't work perfectly like that. But that's the right idea. Okay? So, uh, let's not do a quiz. <laughs> Isotopes. Protons define the element. Okay, so this is where we're actually getting to our details here. The neutrons define the isotope. They define the mass. Okay, this gets us the type of element. Okay, atoms of the same element have different number of neutrons are referred to as isotopes. Okay, so you'll notice that we listed up here hydrogen has two common isotopes. We referenced both of these before. Okay, with our... Oh, I always screw up the numbers. Our atomic number here and our mass number up in the upper left. So we have hydrogen 1 and we have hydrogen 
2. Okay? Scientists don't like really simple names because we want to sound fancy and cool. So instead of calling it hydrogen 1, we call it protium. Why? What's in the nucleus? A proton. How many protons? One. So we call it protium. Okay. Move to the next one, hydrogen 2. It's called deuterium. Okay. What's happening there? What's in our nucleus now? We have a proton, proton, a proton and a neutron. So we have how many particles in our nucleus? Two, also known as deuce. There it is, deuterium. Okay. What happens if we add another neutron? And now we have three particles in the nucleus, and being the super creative awesome people we are, we come up with tritium for tri, for three particles. Okay? So what we're doing is just defining those isotopes. If we wanted to name each of them, we could. Okay? It is typically only done for hydrogen. Why? Hydrogen happens to be one of the most abundant, if not, I think it's the most abundant element in the universe. Okay. So when we encounter different forms of it, we assign names to those because it's important enough to identify. But for chlorine, I said 35 and 37. Do they get their own names? Probably some jerk-off has named them. Okay. <laughs> but for the most part, we refer to them as chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. That's it. Okay. So it's really only hydrogen that gets this extra term. Okay. So let's take a look at an example. How many protons and neutrons does an atom of lead 206 have? Okay. So if we take a look at that term, what does this give us? What's the first part tell us? The element name. To answer this question, what do we have to turn that lead word into? The symbol. So I look for the symbol LE. Just checking. Look for the symbol PB. Our symbol for lead is PB. Okay. The 206 was what? That is our mass number. The mass number is defined as the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Okay. So if I want to figure out the number of protons and neutrons, all I got to do is take that 206 and divide by 2. Thank you. No, I can't do that. Okay. How do I determine the number of protons and neutrons? I take the symbol, PB, and I find it on the periodic table, which is where? 82. That 82 is the number of protons. So by finding the symbol on the periodic table, PB leads to 82 protons. To get the number of neutrons, what do I have to do? I know 206 equals the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. The protons I just solved for were 82. Subtract 82 from both sides. Neutrons equals, <coughs> what'd you say? 124. Thank you. 124. Yes? The protons comes from the atomic number. The atomic number is always on the periodic table. What's the element we're talking about? Lead. Lead, okay. So that's given to us in, our, in the question. So a lot of people might just jump to and say, well, it's 82 and 124, because you could do some of those calculations in your head. You're awesome. The rest of us are not, okay, including me. And since I'm a jealous jerk, write it down. <laughs> that's the work you need to show for this question. Lead is PB. PB means 82 protons. 206 is the mass number. The mass number means protons plus neutrons. Plug in the numbers, solve. Okay, first and then second. So it depends on the question asked. So uh, people like to ask questions like, well, how could I possibly do this? I can ask any variation. I could give you the number of the neutrons and the mass number and say, what's the element? Okay. 
because you could then back calculate, figure out what the proton was, to then figure out what the symbol was. Okay. So any variation within that. Okay. But we've got three variables, the element, the protons, the neutrons. To solve for any one of those, what do you need? You need the other two. Okay. In this case, I gave you the number of protons and the mass number. You could solve for the neutrons. So that's kind of what she's asking. In that format, yes. The mass number is always given after the name. Okay. But I don't necessarily have to give you the mass number. I could say, what is the mass number for lead with 124 neutrons? <coughs> well, you know lead is 82. I just told you the neutrons is 124. Add them up, you have the mass number. So any one of those three. Make sense? The 206 is what? The neutrons plus the protons, which is known as the mass number. Yep, yep. These are perfectly fair game for problem. So that's the exact amount. That's the general amount on there. Yes. Periodic table, that's not a bad way to say it. Periodic table gives you the general amount of neutrons. Mass number gives you the exact. Let's see, where are... I promise I will pick up with this right here, but we're going to talk about it. This gets to our simple versus our weighted averages. Okay. A simple average assumes the same number of all objects. That's the simple average. A weighted average takes into account the amount of each of those objects. Okay. So for instance... If I wanted to take the average of 1 and 2, what would I get? 1.5. Okay, to do that, this would be our simple average. We take 1 plus 2, and I divide it by 2. Why did I divide by 2? That's how many numbers there are. Okay, that gets me my 1.5. Okay, the weighted average comes into play when, largely when we have bigger numbers or more numbers. So instead of just 1 and 2, I'm gonna, I want the average for 1, 1, and 2. What is the simple average approach to this? 1 plus 1 plus 2 divided by 3 gets me whatever that number is. Okay. What does the weighted average go through and do? The weighted average says, well, I have two ones okay, out of a possible three numbers. Plus, I have one, two out of a possible three numbers. This gets me my weighted average. This value in front can be converted into a percent. So when we're talking about elements, we're looking at not averaging three elements or three different isotopes. We're talking about averaging billions. Do you really want to go into your calculator and do 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, plus 1 oh, plus 2 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 3 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, plus one. divided by, oh, now I've got to count them all. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, okay. Instead, we can look at a percent value. That's the weighted average. What's reported on the periodic table is our weighted <coughs> average. We'll pick up with that Thursday. <coughs>